Africa had great kings and queens, you should know. Search your history, it will show you. If you know not from whence you came, you are doomed to live in shame. Great kings of Africa, rulers all about, they were my brave and true. We have a guest, Eugene Hollis from the American Indian Movement, and I guess I bring to you now. Eugene Collins. We lost this land because of our own ignorance. But again, we didn't know any better. We, we were operating from our heart. We always helped everybody that came to us. That our history tells us that. And like we say, we helped your people. We helped all European people. And we didn't know the mistake that we were doing when we were doing that. Because we had an open heart. That's, what, that's the way we are. We help our brothers and sisters. And no matter where you come from, and, and and that was our downfall. We were too too helpful. <laughs> and uh, but like the brother said here tonight, uh, we got to learn. We got to learn our history and our culture. I always knew my culture. I always knew my history. I was always proud of who I was. And I grew up with some young men and some people in our nation. They try to be white. They try to be somebody else. And now they're trying to, they finally woke up after 30 years struggling, thinking they were somebody else. And you can't be nobody else. You just got to be yourself. And when you know yourself, you know your history. You know how proud you are. Like I say, I was always a proud of who I was. And I took a lot of bumps on the head because I stood up because somebody made fun of me or laughed at me or tried to talk against my people. I took a few bumps and rolls and here and there. But I was always proud. I always stood up to what I believed in. And in my family, my brother was a... We followed the system. We tried to work with the system and everything like that. My brother was a chairman for 20 years. He went around the world. He went around the world, he traveled far, he traveled into Russia, he traveled here and there on the government expense, but he had all the wisdom and knowledge of what, how people were treated, no matter where he went. He knew the difference, he knew he was a foreigner in that country. And like you say, our people helped your people when they came here, like the brother said, we took you in. And some of our ancestors, we had the blood of your blood. Your people have the blood of our blood. And we know this. And one, as I had the opportunity to travel all over the country, we were, as American Indian, we were treated just like you people, especially in the North. You know, they call you, they, what you call a uh, Christian. You know, the Christians all say, oh, they, they'll shake your hand and Five minutes later, they're talking about you. But we can, I can't help that. I can't help that. But they are ignorant people. I don't put myself down with them. Shaking your hand, and then five minutes later, they're talk, talking about you. Don't watch you around. That's where they are. And I travel that. My brother traveled that. My, my brother retired, I think he's 70 years old now. And he was a leader of our nation. And you talk about organized, you talk about he, the people, our own people went against them. And that's what you got to watch out. People within, right within, will destroy ourselves. We destroy each other what you're organizing. Get your act together, like the man said. Be together. And always operate from here. Don't operate from here. Do what this says here. And like the brother said, you, you'll know. He'll know. Everyone will know where you're coming from. We have that today in our nation. We have one of the, we have one of the, I think it's the second or third largest Indian nation in the country now. And we're getting rapidly growing bigger and bigger. But the, all our trouble is, is coming within. Because they don't know the history. They don't know, they, they want to be somebody else. ourselves. Oh, the 
the words that were here tonight, I wish I had four or five of my brothers sitting here listening to this man here talk. Because this is what we need. We need somebody to give us that shot in the arm, or whatever, uh, whatever it takes, or a shot in the heart, or whatever it takes to get us going. And get up. Like you say, get up and stay up. We, we do the same thing. We all riled up. Ready to go. And so... I have a sister. I'm very proud of my sister. She's a, uh, I'm the youngest of nine children. Washington and, and uh, the big senator from Arizona. And he gave the impression that we came there to beg again. Like they all say, we're beggars. You know, we're not beggars. We're a proud people. So she got in an argument with this senator. Well, what are you, uh, what are you people doing here? What, what can I do with you? He, he kind of made a beam that we're coming to the bay. What do you mean, uh, we come in here for our rights? And they started arguing, an argument, pretty soon. The senator said, oh, you ought to apologize to me. She said, you ought to apologize to me. We're the landlords of this country. Right. <laughs> and the five people that are on our panel, like you say, they sat back and they came back and disciplined my sister because she had to stand up and talk for what he puts on his pants just like anybody else. He's no better than us. Right. Because they're holding that position. They think they are. They're not. They get up in the morning, they put their pants on the same thing the way we do. They ain't different. But that senator said, you ought to apologize to me. I mean, I'm a Vietnam veteran. I said, I told my sister, I said, well, that's your fault. That's your fault. <laughs> Like you say, I read a little bit of the history of Vietnam and, Viet, uh, and that country, but my sister got up, but our people don't know their own, their own history. They came back and took my sister off that path. The, very, the ignorance is get you in trouble. Remember that. As you say, like the man said last week, couple of Saturday night, I didn't take too much time, but I remember this man distinctly, he said, read your history. And that's all we could learn by. And when you read our history, you read your history, our history. Like a lot of times I travel, travel out the country and somebody asked me what kind of Indian I am. Why should I tell them? They don't know anyhow if I told them. <laughs> I get sick and tired of listening to that. As I know, I said, well, I said, what do you know about the history of this country? How many tribes do you know of? There's 22,000 different people, uh, tribes in this United States. <laughs> so, but tonight, I'm glad to be here, and I like this poster, and I like these flags here. On the wall here tonight, and the only thing I can leave, I really remember, and and read everybody's history. Don't just read your own history, read everybody else's history, like the man said. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you a little story. My aunt, she was she was a gunman. She came to she came south, she went to Hampton. They brought all the Indian people from throughout the west and north. Hampton, Virginia, they said, I think that's where it is. There was a big school there. And a lot of your people came back when we when they left, they came back. And she always told me, and I was just a young man, and I couldn't figure it out right away, but she was telling me, you never marry out of your race. And I was wondering, what was she talking about? But after I grew up, I found out real quick. <laughs> and I tell my kids that. I tell my kids, I got seven children. I told every one of my children, you stay in your race, don't go out. So all my children, all my children got my blood in them. They might be different tribes, but they still got my blood. That's right. I don't cross that line. That's what I believe in. And that's what I was told. So I always respect my elders. That's another thing. I always respect your elders. <laughs> they might not be educated. They might not have had a chance to be educated. 
that they got more wisdom than you ever could comprehend. Remember that. Always respect your elders, what they have to say, because they travel the road longer than we ever will. Even though we're in a jet age, they still travel that faster. They know. So I'd like to thank you for coming here tonight. Thank you. We'd like to thank Brother Eugene Powers of the American uh, Union. We have a dynamic speaker, Kwame Ture, also known, previously known in his early years as Stokely Carmichael. Uh, a little brief, I'm not sure anyone here knows Brother Ture. I first met the brother in Los Angeles I, um, when I was the president of the Black Student Union at my previous institution before I transferred here. And he spoke, and I joined a, at that time I already joined a party. Our African Cuban Revolutionary Party, and I was a member of a study group. And I was reading Wretched of the Earth and other books by Du Bois, Du Bois. And it instilled in me the, the necessary political awareness that I needed to further myself in my education. So this led me into studying more conscious, I guess you say, books and become more aware of the political situations in America and around the world. And that's led to a point where I understood that it was an international struggle that we were, that we were in. And then I joined the Brotherhood of Kemet, which is an African brotherhood here in, in Atlanta, and continued my struggle on. But the foundation came from, my political awareness came from the party. So after this event, if you're interested, there will be an announcement of when the next study session will be, and uh, for those who want to study with the party. Um, a brief, uh, I'd like to thank the Computing Club here in West Brown, the Historical Society, and the African People Revolution, we're probably along with the student government who put together the monies to bring Kwame Ture here tonight. I want that to go unnoticed. Uh, Kwame Ture was at one time the chairman of the Black Panther Party and also the students for a nonviolent coordinating committee, I believe it's SNCC. He uh, then went overseas and became part of the All African People's Revolutionary Party as he studied under Kwame Nkrumah and uh, Sekou Ture. He he's now lives in Africa, but he is a freedom fighter who travels all across the world for the liberation of African people. I won't say any more. Uh, his history speaks for itself, Pan-Africanism, the, the solutions that many of us as African people must seek to study the uh, afflictions that we have here. I bring to you now Kwame Ture. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I uh, want to thank uh, the students for inviting us. This is uh, not the first time we've been to Marsh Brown. As a matter of fact, uh, I can't remember how many times I've been to Marsh Brown. Uh, when uh, the Student Nonviolent Recording Committee had its office in Atlanta, uh, that would be 1960 to about 1967. And as a student at Howard University, I came frequently to Atlanta while working with SNCC. And we did uh, many uh, forays onto the campus of Mars Brown trying to recruit uh, students to these struggles for our people. So uh, this has been uh, our task constantly coming to Mars Brown to try and get the most conscious amongst you who are not caught up in the irrelevancies of life, in the frivolities to which capitalism directs you, for those of you who want to really do something to help your people. So uh, tonight I come in the same vein. And uh, you know, I organized with the All African People's Revolutionary Party, and our party is a Pan-Africanist party. It has chapters all over the world. We have chapters in the United States, in Canada, in England, in the Caribbean, and of course uh, throughout uh, Africa. So, as a Pan-African party, you know, we're strong here, we're weak here, sometimes we fall down here, sometimes we get up here. But uh, we've been doing uh, not too well in Atlanta, and uh, we've been making a lot of uh, forays into Atlanta and doing a lot of work. So, tonight, the uh, purpose for my being here is to get the five most conscious students sitting before me to uh, come and uh, join our party. Uh, let me tell you something. Our task is to always qualify our people's struggle. The struggle can only be qualified by critically organizing quantity. 
The capitalist system will confuse us. In only make progress when there's quantitative advancement. If, for example, you take a child at the age of two and teach them to count to 100, and they do it, this, of course, is great. We're very proud of the child. If at four years old, the child now counts to 1,000, this certainly is oppressive. But if at 21, the child is counting to a million and cannot critically organize, organize these numbers, then the child is mentally retarded. It is only through critically organizing quantity that we get quality. When this child, who can count from one to a hundred, learns to critically organize these figures, that is to multiply, to divide, to add, and to subtract, this ability to critically organize these numbers, this quantity, will have a qualified effect upon the life of the child. They can lay out fields, they can go to the moon. It is only through quality that we make advancements. If you will look, the capitalist system has a sing song it sings since the 60s telling us about how much progress we've made. You know, before you had no mayors, now you have 300 quantity. Before you had no students in white universities, now you got X number quantity. Before you had no people playing basketball on television, now you got quantity. Before, if you look very carefully, all the progress that they put to us is quantitative advancement. And certainly all of us know that this quantitative advancement has had no qualified effect upon the lives of the masses of our people. As a matter of fact, with more African mayors, the conditions are worse than they were before. They are confused into thinking that quantity makes progress. For human beings, only quality, and you get quality from critically organizing quantity. You get quality from critically organizing quantity. Now as a people, you know as a people who are not organized, therefore not critically organizing any quantity that we uh, advance, we uh, also get caught up in uh, making advancement in our struggles through quantitative advancement. If you will look at Watts in 1965, you will see that the Africans there rebelled against an act of police terrorism in 1965. It was the biggest rebellion this country had seen. In 1992, these same Africans rebelled after the Rodney King, uh, 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 the Rodney King rebellion. The rebellion is quantitatively greater. But the power relationship between the people and the police force not only remains the same, it seems that the police force becomes stronger. Therefore, if you're not careful, you might think your people are making progress, but all they're doing is making quantitative advancement, which is not progress. In 1965, we rebelled because of an act of police terrorism. In 1992, we rebelled because of an act of police terrorism. And look, what's how worse it is. In 1965, when we rebelled, they take an African, Tom Bradley, and they make him mayor. Now this Tom Bradley comes from the police force in Los Angeles. He was a lieutenant in the police force. This is where they pulled him from to make him mayor. Now what? We have an African mayor, quantitative progress, and the same incident which happened in 1965, police terrorism against an African, occurs in 1992 against an African with an African mayor in position and there's absolutely nothing he can do about it at all. We want qualitative progress in order to advance our people's struggle. It is in this light I come to speak to you tonight. Now of course I must tell you that I have certain assumptions which you must understand. Because if you don't understand my assumptions, you will not understand my conclusions. I do not want you to agree with my conclusions necessarily. I want you, however, to understand the assumptions which I use to arrive at these conclusions. Now, the first assumption I have is that any brother and sister today in school who sees the way that people are suffering everywhere actually feel that they have a responsibility to help their people. This is my first assumption now. This is my first assumption. And uh, 
I can tell you that as a revolutionary, I did not come to revolution through the ranks of the workers. I came to revolution through the ranks of the intelligentsia. I came to revolution through the same path that you were taking. Therefore, when I speak, I speak to you from my experience, which you are now going to experience. I say that I would assume that any brother or sister in America today, anywhere in the world, any African student, seeing all the problems that their people face everywhere, they must think that they have a responsibility to help their people. If they do not think they have a responsibility to help their people, they are against their people and are totally living out of the culture of their people. Okay, those, those are my assumptions now. Those are my assumptions. Of course, I have one general assumption, and that is that there's only one fundamental purpose of education, and that is to alleviate the sufferings of humanity. All right. Now, my assumptions about, uh, those are general assumptions now, but when I talk about African students, it's more particular. For African students, I figure that they know they have a responsibility to help their people. Now, the capitalist system can confuse them. Let me give you an example. We said that we've had made a lot of quantitative advancements since the 1960s. For example, in Atlanta, when I was uh, uh, working here for the Student Nonviolent Corner Committee, I did not even conceive that an African could become mayor of Atlanta in my lifetime. It was out of my conception. You understand? Of course, it means nothing, but it was out of my conception. Just to show you how fast we move as a people. Because it's your ideas that you move. It's in your ideas that you move. So, Today, of course, there's an African mayor in Atlanta. So we are told that we have made uh, progress because now he wasn't there before, but now he's there. So this man who now becomes mayor, he might actually believe that he became mayor because he was intelligent, because he knew how to wheel and deal with the politics in Atlanta. Because He might have all these reasons. So he might think that he's really there because of his own individual worth and talent. This confusion because the capitalist system has to confuse us. And oppressed people, and oppressed people only make history by fighting against their oppressor. And oppressed people only make history by fighting against their oppressor, not by integrating with their oppressor. Not by integrating with their oppressor. And the capitalist system will so confuse us that when we integrate, they call that a victory. So for example, when the first African becomes mayor of Atlanta, they say, oh, first African to mayor of Atlanta, this is great, you know. And this poor fool might think, oh, I really did this. But the real struggle was the people who shed their blood for him to become mayor of Atlanta. The only reason he became mayor of Atlanta was because the people shed their blood. Therefore, the position which he occupies does not belong to him, but belongs to the blood of the people and must be used to advance the struggles of the people. So we have to give you our assumptions now, so you can see them carefully. Of course, what we say about them is true in his concrete examples. Marion Barry was my first boss. Marion Barry, who's now the mayor of Washington, was the first chairperson of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And I'm going to tell you something about Marion Barry. He was a rough brother. He was there during the time of nonviolence, and I see him get knocked down off the of stools. We'd all be there. We'd get tired, and we'd drag back. We want to leave it. And Marion said, I thought you were elected me as your leader. He said, we did. Well, then I'm getting out, you know, I'm going out there if I'm leaving myself, and I'm getting back on that stool, I'm going out there. So we had no choice but to follow him back out. Marion was a rough brother. Now, uh, of course, when Marion became mayor, we had some discussions. I told him, well, you know, that one's not just for me. You know, everybody, I guess, chooses a path in which they will make their contribution. I knew I couldn't do nothing with that one, so I said, well, not for me. But I told him that I thought that most of the people who were mayors would make a big mistake. And the mistake they made is that they thought power was execution and implementation. Power is conception. Power is conception. So I imagine that they thought that since they were mayor, they could now wheel and deal and they had power, but power is conception. What happens to these people, brothers, when they become mayor, is that they tell the people, okay, I'm going to take care of everything, I'm the mayor, everything is cool, stop struggling. The biggest mistake. That's the biggest mistake they make. What they should say to people is that, now we got the position of mayor, we're going to use this position to struggle harder and struggle more to get further advances. But we say their conception is incorrect. For example, the other day, of course, during the time when Mary was back, Barry was there, we had contact, we spoke all the time. When he was arrested for a crack, we spoke, we discussed some things. Since then, we've been speaking all the time. And uh, recently, I spoke to him, I will meet him the next week again. But when speaking with him recently, he was telling me he had a lot of problems. What are your problems, Mary? Well, the federal government won't give us this money. I said, you got no problem. I said, the only problem is that you allow the conception of mayor by the capitalist system to bind you to the position which you hold. 
I said, if I was me, I wouldn't have no problem. He said, oh, you always got to answer. I said, of course I got to answer. <laughs> I said, if I was me, you know what I'd do? I said, Marion, I know you. When you were much younger, you were arrested everywhere in the South for contributing to the delinquency of minors. That charge was a result of your organizing high school students in the South to face police dogs. And you did it. You say you were a kid then. I imagine you know now, no, you know more now as the other man. I said, if I were you, I'd just pick up the phone. I'd call Clinton. I'd tell him, listen, I need X number of dollars. If I don't get an X number of hours, I'm filling the streets with high school students in non-violent protests, and I'm blocking Washington, D.C. Nothing moves in the Capitol till I get it. And you can start by arresting me. If I got arrested for crack, I could get arrested for big people. <laughs> So the question is one of conception, one of conception. If you're a student in the American capitalist system and you become a student and you accept the conception, you're finished. The conception is that knowledge becomes private property, just like everything else in a backward society. Not only is it private property, it becomes a commodity. Now, you know the capitalist system is a vicious system. We will never tire of saying that because it's the truth, it is a vicious system. No system can make human beings a commodity. But the capitalist system, which makes everything a commodity, will make us a commodity, put us on an auction block and sell us as shadow slaves. Consequently, if the capitalist system will make human beings a commodity, it will also make education a commodity. It will also make education a commodity. And if you're not careful, you will be acquiring education just as a commodity to be able to sell it on the marketplace to advance yourself individually and forget about the people whose blood put you where you are. So you must come clearly to see the assumptions that we have. Fine. First assumption is that any human being, see another human being in trouble, should help them. See them suffering, should try to help them. But students who acquire knowledge have a special responsibility here because this knowledge doesn't come from individuals, it comes from the people, and these students must use the knowledge to help alleviate the sufferings of their people. Thirdly, as African students, there's even more responsibility here because everything we get in this country, we shed our blood for. Everything. No one sitting in this room can show me one advancement, even quantitative, which we have made as a people in this country for which we did not shed our blood, not one. To sit in a filthy five and ten cent store, we must shed our blood. To sit on the bus where we want to sit just like everybody else because we pay the same fare like everybody else, we must shed our blood. If you want to live in any community in this country and you're African and you got the money and you want to live there, you got to shed your blood. I mean, just to get the vote which every foreigner gets just automatically, we've got to shed our blood. Therefore, no one sitting in this room can show me any advancement our people have made in this country without shedding blood, not one. Therefore, the history of the African in this country is clear to the student. My people have shed their blood for everything. If all they're asking me to do is to give up some time to help advance them as a student, really, if I do not do this, I should be cursed. I should be seriously cursed. We come here to get five of you who are the most conscious. Now this aspect of consciousness must be properly understood. Of course, as a revolutionary, for us, consciousness is what counts. Because the more conscious a people are, is how we make revolution. Now consciousness comes from conscience. Consciousness comes from conscience. And conscience is what gives the great moral distinction between animals of the lower form and human beings. That is to say, animals cannot choose values, human beings can. Now you must know something about this conscience. Every human being has it, and it is an innate, it is an innate moral regulator. It is an innate moral regulator. That is to say, if your teacher, your preacher, your mother, your father never told you that you should not cheat, you know that cheating is incorrect because your conscience will tell you so when you cheat. It is a moral regulator. Now, you must not think that conscience just affects the immature aspect of life, the values and ethics of life. It actually affects your, your body in a, biological, uh, in a biological way. You know, in uh, most Western countries today, they do what we used to do in Africa centuries ago. But they knew it now with a machine. They have what they call a lie detector machine. They can put this lie detector to you. And they can ask you questions, and if you're lying, they can detect. And the reason they can detect is because 
the adrenaline gland, when you lie, it excretes more adrenaline than normally. So it's abnormal, and by testing the uh, flow of it, they can actually tell that you are lying. So when you lie, it doesn't just have an immaterial aspect on your life, it has an effect upon your body. It has a proper effect upon your body. So this conscience now, this conscience is what gives us consciousness. In a system where you want to keep a people oppressed, you must give them false consciousness. Now let me show you what false consciousness is. Now, oh I forgot, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot. You know, I have uh, one assumption I must tell you. You know, people tell me, oh, no one must own they say, you know, I'm so disencouraged, I'm so discouraged, I'm so See how come you don't get frustrated? Or how come you don't get discouraged? Because <laughs> I know I'm a win. <laughs> I know. Now, the norm I'm a win is not based on faith. Don't think that at all. This is revolution. And revolution is a science, it's precise. As a matter of fact, errors in my work of life are fatal. Therefore, when I say I'm a win, don't think I'm just saying that because I'm a revolutionary and I think I got to win. No, we're going to win. All people fighting against oppression will win. You know why? Listen to me carefully. Because the ma- struggle is unjust, you must lie to the people and let them think it's a just struggle. Let us take the enemies of humanity. Let us bring forward Hitler. When Hitler brought the Nazis together to dominate the world, he didn't tell them, hey, listen, we're going to come together and rip off the world. Everybody take what they want. We're going to do what? No. He said, we have been unjustly treated. The European powers have stripped of us everything that belongs to us. They have reduced us to life on a savage like in Africa. We're just another colony. We must take back that which justly belongs to us. You heard the word justly. Therefore, Hitler, in bringing the Nazis together, even though they were committing unjust acts, had to preach to them just reasons for their unjust actions. A few years ago, the United States of America was at war with Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh, a great man who's made a tremendous contribution to humanity, used to tell the Vietnamese people, you're fighting for justice, you're fighting for freedom, you're fighting for democracy. Lyndon Bain Johnson, the president of the United States of America, when calling American troops together to send them to fight in Vietnam, would say to them, you're fighting for freedom, you're fighting for justice, you're fighting for democracy. Somebody must be lying somewhere. But what is important here is to show you that People come together around just instincts and come quickly together around just instincts. And you can see this from your own history. Why, your people have just instincts that make them produce uh, action that shocks the world. Look at the Rodney King Rebellion. It's based on just instincts that they came together when the police were released, refusing to, re- refusing to accept this act of injustice, and together they just rebelled. So I know that we are going to arrive at justice based on our just instincts. And this is just instincts for everyone. Consequently, when I say we're going to win, I'm not giving you some rhetoric. I'm not giving you some little off the... I'm telling you we're going to win because scientifically we're going to win. Show me anywhere people have been oppressed where they didn't fight. Show me anywhere where they do not continue to fight irrespective of the length of time. Of course, you may not know the fight is going on and therefore think the fight is not going on. For example, many people in this country think that the indigenous people of this country, the American Indians, are no longer fighting. I don't know why they think that. Well, some of their greatest warriors sit in jail right now, held in prison by the American capitalist system, such as Leonard Peltier, who's been in jail for 19 years. <laughs> anyway, you'll find the people are struggling, so we struggle, we struggle. Now we struggle on two levels, the conscious level and the unconscious level. The level of instinct and the level of reason. The struggles we've been involved in in the past have been instinctive struggles. They have been spontaneous struggles. They have been unorganized struggles. You, as students, 
have a responsibility to transform your people's struggle from quantitative advancement to qualified advancement. You as students have a responsibility to transform your people's struggle from unconscious struggle to conscious struggle, from temporary struggle to permanent struggle, from unorganized struggle to organized struggle. We say that we get quality by critically organizing quantity. We are going to win because of the instinctive love of justice that the people have. And nobody proves this better than us. Kwame Nkrumah says, you do not judge a people by the heights they have achieved, but the depths from which they have come. Anytime you look at the history of us, see where we've come from with nothing and where we are today, you must be a fool to think we're not going all the way. You just look at your people's history and you will see that, you know, they did all this, they came from slavery to this point. Oh, what's going to stop us now? What drugs? Give me a break. If that was our only enemy, we could sleep through this one. <laughs> yes, your people have come through too much to even think about sitting down. You have this responsibility. Now you can get false consciousness, I gave an example of it. Hitler gave the Nazis false consciousness. He let them actually think that they were involved in a just struggle when they were involved in an unjust struggle. The Americans who sent young men to die in Vietnam gave them a false consciousness. They let these young people in America think they were going to Vietnam to fight for equality, to fight for justice, to fight for freedom, when in fact they were not. They were going there to fight for the interests of capitalism. Therefore, here too, they were given a false consciousness. So you can't be given a false consciousness. Let me show you how it works for us. Africans in this country are brutalized and oppressed. I mean seriously oppressed, seriously brutalized. And do you know Africans in this country are the first ones to defend America when she's attacked? <laughs> you see the false consciousness? You see the false consciousness? With all that we suffer, our minds are so distorted by capitalism that we should be the first ones to leave America, we're the last ones to even look to Africa. I mean, when you look at the Europeans who came to this country voluntarily, they left Europe voluntarily in their conception, in their conception, they thought they were coming to a better life, whether they were free, fleeing religious persecution or fleeing jails. Therefore, every European which left Europe coming to America left so voluntarily thinking that they were going to get a better life. No Africa. Not even the biggest Uncle Tom today could think that when we left Africa in a slave ship that we would come into any place other than hell. And we started in hell, and we're still in hell. <laughs> now Europeans who left look back to Europe. They left voluntarily, but they look back. Africans who were dragged out against their will are one of the worst horrendous conditions that humanity has ever seen. They don't even want to look back to Africa. False consciousness is everywhere. Your job as students is to destroy it and give your people true consciousness. Now let me tell you something about consciousness. Since it's come from conscience, conscience can only develop in the truth. Conscience can only develop in the truth. Anytime you're living a lie, you're denying conscience. For example, as students, you instinctively know you should not cheat. Instinctively know it. Yet, if you cheat, you're denying conscience. If you cheat, you're denying conscience to grow. If you do not cheat and you become honest to struggle, then conscience really grows. Consciousness grows only in the truth. Of course, you can get false consciousness, as Hitler himself said, he was a master at it. Hitler said, you can tell a lie a million times, the people will come to think it's the truth. Revolutionaries say, you can tell the truth a couple of times, it will smash a million lies. And this, of course, is a fact, against thanks to the instinctive love of justice. Once you hear the truth, you understand, you may not want to know it's the truth, you got to admit it's the truth. I mean, even if you lie to your mother and she doesn't know you lied to her, you know you lied to your mother. You know you lied to your mother. So consciousness is always there and must develop in the truth. Therefore, the only way our people, hear me well, can develop our consciousness is when the truth is advocated. But everywhere the enemy lies to us, everywhere. And you know, people get confused. The indigenous people of this country, the American Indians say, capitalism does not lie some of the time. It lies all of the time. When it tells the truth, it's the result of a double lie. And that's the truth. <laughs> that's, that's the truth. That's, that's, this system lies everywhere. Therefore, if you want consciousness, it means that you have to fight against the system on every level. We go step by step. 
A conscious brother, a conscious sister who wants to help the people and know that the people must live in truth, knowing that the people's history is nothing but lies, knowing that the people's history is nothing but lies, as taught in America, will do everything to find the truth of the people's history. So therefore, if you are a truly conscious brother and sister, you are doing everything to find the truth. And let me tell you something, as a student who came through your ranks into the, into the role of revolution, let me tell you that uh, you have to go and get the truth for yourself in America. It's not given to you. Not on CNN, not on rap records, not anywhere. You have to go and dig it up and get it yourself. So anytime you're not looking outside of your curriculum, you're not a conscious student. Anytime you're not looking outside of your curriculum, you are not a conscious student. Because a conscious student understands precisely in actions the words of Frederick Douglass, where there is no struggle, there is no progress. And conscious students do not run away from struggle, they run to struggle, and the most conscious runs to the most difficult struggle. Of course, as students, you must understand this. You take a conscious student in biology, the one who runs away from the difficult problems in biology will never master biology. It is she who runs to the difficult concepts of biology, fights with them, struggles with them, and masters them that will make advancement in biology. Therefore, the conscious student, understanding in living reality the words of Frederick Douglass, does not run away from struggle, but runs to struggle. Of course, even in doing that, you must fight the capitalist system. You know, it is so backward that it can convince students that they must struggle for a little while, and after they struggle, they can sit down and enjoy life. They don't do nothing else no more. So there's some students that ask me to think that, well, I gotta go to Morris Brown, I gotta read for four years, but after I get my degree, I don't have to read another book again in my life. You see it. How your government shows that one takes struggle to the grave. And if Frederick Douglass said, where there's no struggle, there's no progress, and we must make progress till we die, listen to this, struggle is eternal. We are speaking of conscious men and women. A stupid man, a stupid woman, may think that she who consumes the most and produces the least is a successful man or woman. This is acting like an animal. Animals cannot produce, they can only consume. A conscious human being must know that they must produce more than they consume because they have to leave something for those who come after them. Therefore, the conscious student, the conscious student is looking to produce more than they consume, looking again to live in truth. We say the truth is that the capitalist system lies to the people about their history. Therefore, it is the job of the conscious student to find the people's history and to give the people their history and to give with them the truth of their history. We say power begins on a level of conception. The reason why we have all the trouble we have with the people in this country is because we have no conception of our people as a people. Therefore, to kill each other means absolutely nothing. Anyone talking other than that knows nothing of what they speak. The only reason we do this is because we have no conception. It is the job of the intelligentsia to give the people a conception of themselves. Of course, everyone has a task. You may live up to your task or not live up to your task, but do not think you do not have a task. As students, you have a responsibility. Your task, we say, is to qualify your people's struggle. You may not live up to the task, but do not think you don't have a task, therefore betraying the task. It is clear here when we say you have a responsibility to come to qualify the struggles of the people. Africa is not held up anywhere. Our people are ashamed of Africa. Ashamed of Africa. Africa ain't never produced no Nazis. Ashamed of Africa. Who is Africa oppressed? I mean, they're so confused that this, this capitalist system just makes everything back. But you know, if you were to oppressed in this country, you would think the poor are criminals and the rich are saints. I mean, everybody know the rich are criminals. Matter of fact, if you're rich, you're automatically criminal. The poor are not criminals, the poor are supposed to make revolution. But they're going to have you so confused that you think the poor must be criminals and not make revolution. The poor are going to make revolution. And they're going to make it against the criminal rich. And they're going to strip the criminal rich of what he criminally accumulated. This is clear. It happens everywhere in every country. People are ashamed of Africa. Why are they ashamed of Africa? Because of the lies. What is the job of the student? Is it not your job to give your people their history? The truth of their history? And how will you know the truth of your people's history if you're not going outside of a curriculum which is made to keep your conception against your people? Simply put, the conscious student understands that they must do extra work 
to advance the people's struggle. Simply put, the conscious student understands that they must do extra work to help advance the people. We said the conscious student is happy to do this. Which student is not happy to sacrifice for the people? We all clap at Martin Luther King. When we clap at Martin Luther King, we must know what we're doing. We're saying, I too wish I could take a bullet for my people. This is precisely what we say. I too would like the honor to be able to die for my people. This is precisely why we clap for Martin Luther King, whether we know it or not. Or else, why else do we clap? Because he's a movie star? We clap for King because we want to be like King. We clap for King because King did what we're supposed to do. But if we clap for King and leave it like that, obviously we're not serious. Obviously we're not serious. Who would not want to sacrifice for their people? Who, given the honor to sacrifice for their people, would not rise to the occasion? It's only a people completely distorted their thinking by a vicious capitalist system that would not do that. You students have a golden opportunity, an opportunity to serve your people. And some of you missed this opportunity, simply confused by the capitalist system, trying to get a car, a house, a this, a that, rather than working for your people seriously. We come to get the conscious. We come to get those conscious students, the ones who want to take the extra time to learn their history. And I'll tell you what, the student who has a proper conception of themselves will be the best academic student on the campus. Never did I saw a student tell me, you know, Brother Bobby, I've got to do physics, and you know it's difficult for us. Us who? You know us, you know, we go to basketball and all that, even we might even get by with math, but you know physics, we can't do, we can't do physics. Why? Well, you know, people gave physics to the world. Once you know that your people gave physics to the world, you know you have a responsibility to add to the contribution which your people made. It's a question of conception. Who will teach them this, if not you? But I say you must look for it. What the capitalist system does to these students is pathetic. I mean, they have the ability to help their people and not even see how to, they don't even concern about helping their people. You must come to get the history of Africa. The you know, African People's Revolutionary Party in our program gives the history of Africa to our country. It must be properly studied, properly discussed, properly analyzed, because the job of our party is to spread the history of our people to the masses of our people to let them know what the great things that Africa have done. I don't see how any student, any student, any student cannot be proud of Africa if they studied anything about world history or world civilization. Because Africa has made contributions to every area of world history and world civilization. Therefore, your task must be studying this, even in the area of Christianity alone. Well, when you tell your people what Africa has done to Christianity, they, being great Christians, will be great Africans. Proud to be Africans. When Jesus Christ, peace be upon his name, was in trouble and everybody wanted to kill him, who gave him refuge? Only Africa. Only Africa. It was here where he grew up in his youth. And it was only here that he can grow up understanding what it did because Africa had already centuries before the birth of Jesus Christ, peace be upon his name, given monotheism, belief in one God, to the world. Centuries. It was centuries before his birth. Therefore, when he came into Africa, he could breathe in. Uh -huh monotheism, belief in one God, he can, uh, he can, even through osmosis, get the spirituality that Africa had to offer. The first country mentioned in the Bible, Genesis 2, verse 13, is Africa. Genesis 2, verse 13. If you just do statistical history of, that, of the Bible, Egypt and Ethiopia is mentioned more than any other country in the Bible, starting with Israel. These are just statistical facts. The first church in the world came out of Africa. The first monastery in the world came out of Africa. The very intellectual development of the church came out of Alexandria, which is in Egypt, which still is in Africa. <laughs> well, we're always trying to pull it out. And now see how people get confused. The sister properly said, the further back you go into Egypt's history, the blacker it becomes. Right. And that is absolutely clear. Absolutely clear. You have a responsibility here. Once Africans know of Africa's contribution to Christianity, those who are Christians will not be proud. Therefore, your job is already established. It is you who must educate the masses of your people. It is you who have the task of educating the masses of the people. We have been working with the intelligentsia for a long time, those of us who are revolutionary. 
We know that the African intelligentsia is the most corrupt in the world. They're the most corrupt because the African bourgeoisie is the most corrupt in the world. I mean, it's the most corrupt. When you see the people that we have all over the world in positions of leadership over us, you know there's nothing but the scum of our race. They are corrupt, as corrupt as you can get. And the African intelligentsia is fighting to join the bourgeoisie, therefore they're already corrupted. But the struggle which we wage with you is one which will give you no peace. Dr. W. E. B. Du Bois waged the same struggle. He said that you were the talented tenth. And that as a talented tenth, you had a responsibility to help the 90% who sacrificed for you to get here and to help them. But you've never looked back at them. The talented tenth always keeps looking forward. We come tonight to get the five most conscious of you. Those of you who realize that you have a responsibility to your people and that this responsibility to your people can only be fulfilled in a systematic, daily manner. In a systematic, daily manner. You cannot fight the police of Atlanta once in a while. They oppress us every day. The police department never takes a vacation. They operate for 24 hours. They eavesdrop on the entire community, on the entire community. They eavesdrop on the entire community. They follow the entire community. They have all our records there 24 hours a day. Now they got computers when they want to check out what you're doing. They just punch your button with your name for 24 hours. In 1965, when we revolted in Watts, the police worked for 24 hours up to 1992. If we revolt in 65, sit down, and revolt again in 92, and sit down, that's all we will be doing. Revolting and sitting down. Revolting and sitting down. Revolting and sitting down. We must revolt, get up, and stay up, and go from revolt to revolution. It's the only solution. It's the only solution. You have this responsibility. We said that you must bring out the history of Africa so that your people become proud. Not only must you show the people the history of Africa to make them proud, you must show them that we as a people will only get where we're going when we are consciously organized when we are consciously organized. Of course, the conscious student understands the necessity of organization. You know, some Africans are so backward. The other day I said one, brother, why don't you come on, help us, man? People in trouble. I want you to help us people. We try to organize them. People, what they ever do for me? Have they ever done anything for me? No, they just taught you how to teach, speak, so you can insult them. That's all. That's all. They taught you how to speak. That's all. So you can insult them. That's all. Your people, everything you have, you work for people. The conscious student knows this. The conscious student may be confused by American capitalism, which takes individualism to ludicrous heights like Rambo and Superman, and they think that they are going to lead the people. That's nonsense. As a matter of fact, if you just look at the character, the character of your people's history, you will see this is nonsense. We have a mass character in struggle. They will say, in 1960, the movement was led by Dr. Martin Luther King. In the next breath, they will say, the mass movement. Everywhere you look, you will see we, our struggle is mass in character. We can give it to you in one sentence, from slave revolts to urban rebellions, mass in character. Of course, this, guy, this struggle, which is mass in character, is unorganized and spontaneous. This is the problem. This is the problem. We rise up, we get mad, and then we sit down. And even here, Morris Brown, as jive as you all are, if uh, some white people come up on this campus and make trouble with some brother or sister, for two weeks, you ought to be hot. For two weeks, I mean hot. Here you're not the top, you've got to do something. <laughs> and then after you will sit down and let it pass and wait again for the next incident. Your job as a conscious student is to examine your people's struggle and see how you can help to qualify it. If you look at our struggle, you see we're always reacting to the enemy. In 1965, in Watts, we reacted to police terrorism. In 1992, with Rodney King, we react to police terrorism. Reacting to the enemy doesn't stop the enemy. You must make the enemy react to you. And the only way this can be done is when you are consciously organized. All right, this aspect of organization is clear now. Power comes only from the organized masses. Power comes only from the organized masses. Your people are a serious people in struggle. 
But now you know one learns many ways, and your people learn through method of illumination. It is the slowest method to learn, but it is the surest. It is the slowest method to learn, but it is the surest. Your people have eliminated a lot of things that they've been told. The only thing they have not done is organize themselves. You must make a clear distinction between organization and mobilization. The enemy will confuse you here. I hear people telling me all the time, oh, Brother Kwame, I wish I was with you in the 1960s. You all were so organized. We were not organized. We were mobilized. You mobilize over issues. You organize over ideas. You mobilize over issues. You organize over ideas. And the 60s was nothing but mass mobilization, not organization. Even when you make the statement, it's made without the slightest examination of your people's history. The capitalist system confused some of them to let them think that they could think about their people's history without even studying their people's history. If you look very carefully, there were five major organizations that confronted the system in this country in the 60s. The NAACP, 